Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Dato Najib for taking his time off to join us today at Invest Malaysia Virtual Series 2 uh, to have a conversation on the opportunity and challenges facing the Malaysian palm oil industry. So Dato Najib is an industry veteran. He needs no introduction. He wears many hats, but today he's wearing the hat of CEO of Malaysian Palm Oil Association. So to start off today's uh, conversation, uh, Dato Najib, maybe you can start off by sharing with us uh, what are the current key issues uh, facing the Malaysian palm oil industry. Okay, uh, thank you, Avi. I'm quite disappointed, actually, the Tipalan Menteri left because uh, I would like to first acknowledge uh, the Malaysian government and especially the Ministry of uh, Plantation Industry for allowing the industry to operate during the MCO. That was very important because, because of that we survive. Uh, I mean, if you were to understand plantation business, imagine if you were to shut down the operation for two weeks, it takes two months to recover. What more if you were to operate, if you close it down for two months? Then I do not, I dread talking about it. So anyway, uh, I mean, I think, uh, the plantation industry is actually at the crossroad now. Uh, we are saddled with uh, and plagued with many issues. And uh, there's a long list of issues, but I would just like to highlight the main issues. And uh, one of them is the labour shortage. The labour situation now is very acute, especially for the plantation sector. Even pre-COVID, pre-COVID, we are short of about 36,000 workers. And these 36,000 workers has resulted in us not realizing our potential production by about 10 to, 20, 10 to 25%. You just imagine the losses incurred. And while during the MCO, we managed to retain these workers, what we are concerned more is post-MCO especially with the government decision of freezing all recruitment of foreign workers. Meaning that for the past three, four months, we have not received any workers. Post-MCO, there'll be more workers wanting to leave home, and we got nobody to replenish, replenish this workforce. So I am, I am really deeply concerned with this decision by the government to freeze uh, recruitment of foreign workers. We have conveyed our concern to the ministry and hopefully, hopefully the minister or the ministry will take due consideration with our problem with regards to labour shortages. The other issue is our stagnating yields. You know, the yields in the plantation sector has been stagnated. And of course, one of the reasons recently is the shortage of workers. But there are also other variable reasons. You know, the weather has been very extreme of late. You get El Nino, then you get La Nina. So these are all causing the yields to fluctuate. And the other issues is our soil. You know, we are into our fourth generation of planting. And as you replant, your soil get degraded. So that has caused a lot of your potential yields not being able to achieve. So right when I started my career 40 years ago, till today, we have not seen such significant jump in yields. So, so that, that is our issues which need to be addressed. Okay? The other one, of course, every know, everybody knows about the negative perception on palm oil. So this is something which we need to work closely with the government. We need to address this issue. While we have done a lot of things, what we have done seems to be not be good enough. Goalposts keep on changing. So, but we do not have a choice, but we have to engage and work on this one. So, so these, these are issues which uh, I think uh, are putting the industry at the crossroad. So beside that, beside that, I would like to 
highlight this, that not many people know that the plantation sector pays the biggest tax to the government. You know, beside the corporate tax of 24%, we have windfall tax, we have levies, we have SES, we have property assessment tax, we have quit rent to pay, and even now, railway crossings, so we have to pay. So, so these this are the things which are eroding, eroding the profitability of the industry. Right. All right? So, so if these are all the main points, of course, we got a lot of other issues which I do not want to highlight, mm. but, but these are the things which I think uh, we, we need to address it. Mm. Uh, we need to holistically look at it, especially post-MCO, what best can be done to address. One has to remember this industry has about a million smallholders who who depend, the livelihood depend on it. And this is something, if, if the government do not address, it can be a big social issue. So, so we are working closely with the government, the industry, and there's a lot of GLC who are in this business. And, uh, and we, we are grateful that the government acknowledged this problem, mm. but the problem is that we have yet to find a solution to it. Right, okay, thanks, Dato. So maybe we move on to the second question. So given the many challenges that the industry is facing, some industry observers are raising concern that this industry could be a sunset industry. What is your opinion on this? After, if I answer your question, then I will contradict what I said earlier. Okay. All right? Uh, no, I believe this is not the sunset industry. This, you know, we are the... After the tourism sector, we are the biggest employer in this country. And last year, despite the low CPO price, we generate about close to 5% of the GDP. All right? So meaning that this is an important sector in the country. It is not a sunset industry, but it is an industry full of challenges and obstacles. We have survived 100 years. You know, this is the longest, most matured industry in this country. We celebrated our 100 years commercial cultivation two years ago, and I believe we can move forward, but we have to look at it differently. Okay. So maybe you can move on to your opinion on what do you think are the areas that we could look differently to improve the competitiveness of the palm oil industry? Okay. Most important thing, I think, you know, uh, the land in Malaysia is saturated. This, this is actually no more land to plant. So, if you are thinking of expanding, forget about it. There's no way. I think most of the Malaysian industry players, they have lost their appetite to expand. Because of the high cost of expansion, the issues with environment, so, we are not going to do that. The focus should be on raising yields, getting more crop over the same land area. That is where I think we should be focusing on. So, if we can do that, we can do that, then we can address a lot of other issues. And the biggest issue we need to address is the foreign workers we use. We are so reliant on foreign workers. Today, 84% of the plantation workers are foreigners. And plantation work is still manually reliant. You know, we are... The basis of uh, measurement is on the land to man ratio. Okay? One worker covers eight hectare. I think 40 years ago, when I started working, it was one to six. After 40 years, we moved to 1 to 8. And I think the more efficient companies is now about 1 to 10. We have to look into quantum leap technologies. How do we raise it up to 1 to 16? Okay? Of course, we need technology to do that. And doing so, it has to be a joint collaboration with the government. The industry has all this while been very... What is, you say, uh, able to survive because we know there's ability of workers. 
the locals doesn't want to work, it's all right. We can get foreign workers. Now getting foreign workers too is also a problem. The shortage of workers in this country is not because the government does not allow. Because now even workers, example from Indonesia, we are, where we are so dependent upon, 70% of our workforce are Indonesian. They too are having problems because they too are expanding. So we need to work into how we can automate our industry. I give you an example. Example, I mean, this is a bit far-fetched here. If you see a, a palm oil bunch, how you took it down? Maybe you can use laser gun, something like that. Huh? So, so these are things which I think the scientists, uh, the scientists need to seriously look into. Otherwise, we will lose our competitive edge within the sector or even with our neighbours, with our regional peers, we will lose the advantage because we do not have the workforce. This is a small country. We started, we were the pioneers, but that competitive edge, we have already started losing it. What do you think uh, is so difficult for Malaysian planters to mechanise or automate their processes in the estate? Why is it taking us so long? We are complacent because we know that we can get workers from outside. When the Malaysian shun working in the plantation, we know there's alternatives. We got Indonesians, we can depend on the Bangladeshi. As long as we can depend on that, so the attention, you just imagine if you put this palm oil tree in, in Japan today, uh, you're going to see a different thing, right? Mm. So likewise, I think we are now at the crossroad. Mm. I think the industry do not have a choice. If we were to survive and if we want to last, uh, then the focus should be on this area. Right. If you look at the industry today, how many percent of the work at the estate can actually be mechanised today? Actually, we have done a lot of mechanization, mm. but the critical operation, which is the harvesting of the fruit, mm. that is one which we have yet to have something commercially viable. Mm. There's a lot of far-fetched theories, far-fetched machine. I mean, they have invented a machine cost 250,000. Which small holder can afford that machine, right? Mm. So nothing is commercially viable at the moment. So we are still manually reliant on that operation. But in terms of crop evacuation, uh, milling, I think we have advanced a lot. Right. Uh, but end of the day is you need to take the fruit down. Has there been any initiative done to try yes. and get yes. the Yes, I think earlier there was initiative by the private sector, by even by the government to MPOB. But the urgency wasn't that great. Mm. Right? So now we have brought this up, the industry has brought this up with the government again. We, I think we need to form a consortium, we have to rope in, mostly in, and we have to seriously look at it. Mm. This is our survival. Right. right. Okay. So apart from addressing the yield, what would be the second areas you think the industry can look at to try and improve their competitiveness. Okay, just now I've related the automation. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, is something, uh, that is something we uh, have to do, it's interrelated. Right. The other one is how to we improve our perception of palm oil. Mm -hmm. okay. this, this is important. I think the, the perception is so bad now. Even our locals, even our locals think that palm oil is bad for health, palm oil is bad for the environment. So the engagement with the uh, public uh, need to be enhanced. But more important, uh, more important, I think, we need to walk the talk. We claim that we are not going to plant above 6.5 million hectares. First, we have to make sure that we are not 6.5 million hectares. Number two, we claim that we are going to retain our forests not less than 50%. Uh, we say that we are already have uh, uh, sustainable certification. We need to show them. We need to walk the talk and we need to show that we are doing this. 
until and otherwise that perception will persist. In this aspect, I think the government have to play its role. Because in, in Malaysia, the problem with Malaysia is land matters are state jurisdiction. So federal has little control over land matters. So each state will decide on how the land is to be managed. So this is an area which I think we, we need to, it has to be coordinated more in, in a more transparent manner. Okay. Um, so maybe we move on to the CPO price. Now, if you look recently, the CPO price has climbed to a high of as high as I think two five, two six, or to even two seven level. So, what do you think is driving the CPO price recently, and what's your outlook on price as well as the fundamental behind CPO price? Okay, I think I think we are very fortunate. We are very happy that the price. In fact, last Friday price was above two thousand six, and that is a very comfortable level for all, even for the smallholders. That figure is very comfortable and we are very happy with it. The question is whether we can sustain that price level. I, you know, recently one of the price guru estimated that Malaysian palm oil will top 20 million tons and that uh, our stock level at year end will be about close to 3 million tons. I beg to differ. I am not a price guru, uh, but I am very bullish about the situation. I do not think our yield level will surpass 20 million ton. Hmm. The fact is that we are short of workers and the shortage is going to be more acute. The fact is that the weather last year has not been very kind to us. The fact is that we have not put enough fertilizer last year. This will all has an impact on our yield this year. I believe yields will be equal or even lower than what we achieved last year of 19.5 million tons. Mm. So, so I, I, I am being bearish in terms of volume is good, you know, mm. right? We should be bullish on prices, yeah. but stock level at 3 million tons will have a big impact on your prices. I personally believe it all depends on how we recover from this pandemic. If we are sustaining at the level we are doing now with a lot more big, bigger export numbers, India taking up, China taking up, that level will not be achieved, especially when your production is down. Mm. So I am, I do not think that stock level we hit beyond 2.5 uh, million tons. That is my opinion. So you are bullish on prices? You think this level can sustain? I am quite optimistic. Uh, maybe not to six, okay. uh, not to six. You know, if we can achieve an average of 2004 a year, I think that is comfortable with a lot of people, even for the smallholders. The only issue here is about your yield. Because yield result in costs, mm. uh, and costs result in profits. Because the yields in this country is very, the disparity is very wide. Mm. You have Companies, GLCs, or private uh, smallholders yielding 10 tons per hectare. Then you get the more efficient companies, the big boys earning, yielding 25 tons per hectare. When you have that kind of disparity in yield, of course you have a big disparity in cost as well. So, so uh, then I will touch on the cost of production in Malaysia. I would, I would use it the cost of sale. This is our biggest problem. Mm. Our costs keep on going up because labor costs keep on moving up, material costs keep on going up. Mm. Our, so today, today our cost of sales, the most efficient will be about 2005, 2006. Okay? 
mm. and that is on the back of good yields, well-managed costs. Mm. On the other hand, there are a lot of companies which I'm aware of, or even GLCs. I mean, I am privileged to know the cost of one GLC, mm. where I was the chairman. It ranges up to 2,000 plus. So, so there's a big gap. But at 2004, which is a realistic number, not too high for buyers to buy, able for us to compete with the other oils, and on our part, it is, we can still make reasonable profit. But most important thing, I think what we need to do is we need to be more efficient. There have to be less wastages, reduced wastages, less leakages, mm. uh, then we are able to do that. It has been proven. The more efficient, transparent company, the yields are about 24, 25 tons. If they can do it, why can't the others? Right? But one of the issues of yields have to do with the age profile of the, the trees, right? And in Malaysia, our age profile of, of Malaysian palm oil estates is probably on the older side, 20 years and above. So what would you recommend you know, the industry to do in terms of replanting or government assistance, given that it costs quite a bit to replant uh, estates? I think the age profile, of course, I fully agree, age profile dictates your yield. If you were to do a normal replanting program of 4 to 5% a year, you will add it up with an age profile of about 10 to 11. Mm. That kind of age profile is ideal in this country and it will give you good yields. The problem with us is when the price is low, we do not replant. So we compound this problem. Mm. We have seen a lot of GLC where the age profile is skewed much to the right, meaning that up to 40% of the palms are above 25 years. Okay, That is where the problem arises. Mm. And then you go into an accelerated replanting program. Mm. Just doing replanting is not good enough. Mm. You have to do good replants. Mm. Because I noticed that the fault of a lot of companies. Mm. They go on an accelerated replant and say, now my age profile is good. But then you ended up having 50, 60 pounds per hectare. How are you going to get those yields eh, with that kind of age profile? Mm. So this is, where, this is where there's a lot of mismatch, a lot of things decoupled in the process. And I would attribute that to inefficient management. Mm. So, so we need to buck up. And so does a lot of the GLCs. Mm. We, they need to buck up as far as it's concerned. If you want to compete, mm. if you want to be profitable, and I think you can, some of these GLC, they were good, they were making good money before because they were efficient. So does the private sector. Right. But then they do not have the other problems, labor issues, or not issues. So we, we need to manage that well. And I believe, in, I believe if a concerted effort and we work with the government, we would be able to achieve this. Yes. Right? Okay. You know, a lot of people say that now is the time for us to look at about recruiting Malaysians. Mm. News says that 800 Malaysians are out of job. And for that very reason, I think the government decided to freeze the recruitment of foreign workers to assist. Mm. We are for it. We are for it. The industry are for recruitment of local workers. Mm. So what we have done, we have initiated, we've taken steps to recruit to advertise, put billboards everywhere, work with JTK. But frankly speaking, I know that the response is lukewarm. Malaysians does not seem to be wanting to work in the plantation. Last time they call it 3D. Okay? Dirty, difficult, dangerous. I add on one more D. Because now they say it's demeaning to work in the plantation. So so we have not given up hope. We are still trying. We are still working closely with the government. We take the message of the minister that we will encourage as many as mentioned to work in the plantation. 
But in the event, if all this fails, then we have to depend on the government to assist us in opening up back for us to recruit workers. But we will, we will show the government that we are making effort. Right. Okay. You know, I mean, Ivy, you have visited plantation, right? Mm, yes. uh, if you were to stay in an estate, the quality of life in the plantation is better than living in KL. Serious. You got a three bedroom house, yeah. free, free electricity, uh, mm. free transport. We even give cooking oil, we even give rice. No takers. Why do you think that's the case? Is it the salary? I do not think so. Take home salary in a plantation is much higher than working in KL. Uh, it's just that people shun, people want to be in the bright light. Uh, people does not want to... In fact, living in the plantation is very healthy and nice, you know. I miss living in the plantation. I used to be a planter. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so, so I think... Uh, but it's something that I think a lot of the plantation companies told me that they have tried many years, various ways, with limited success in terms of getting the locals. So I guess we'll see this time because of the high unemployment rate, whether... Yes, I think better. this is another test. Yes. Whether they are willing to come in. Mm. Uh, I got some initial feedback from some companies. So far, it's quite lukewarm. Okay. Uh, uh, I think the problem with us is mobility. You know. They are so comfortable living in one place. Mm. Even earning low income is all right. Even being jobless is all right. Rather than sacrificing, moving to the plantation, leading a new life. I did offer few, few people, I mean, I mean, few destitute are snuff. Uh. Mm. I mean, I visited them, no food, uh, no house, says, come, I offer you a job. Your wife, I offer you a job. But mm. tak mau. Okay. So, that's, that's the fact of life today. Right. Maybe one day, maybe one day, if we have quantum leap technologies, uh, where we can use laser to harvest, uh, where we can the income of the workers is ten thousand a month, mm. maybe. Yeah. So hopefully the scientists can really come up with something hopefully. as yeah. soon as possible. Mm. All right. Have you heard anything that is uh, revolutionary for the industry so far? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So in terms of long-term CPO price that we should aim for to keep the smallholders' income fairly decent, uh, you think two four, two five would be I think good. I think a reasonable price level, uh, which is not too high, but also not low. I think two four, two five is a good price. In fact, this year, mm. this year I'm very optimistic that the prices will be averaging for the whole year mm. at the level of two four to two five. Mm. You know, last year. Despite being a normal year, our average was just above 2,000. Right. So at this level, it's actually with all the problem I mentioned, with all the issue raised, mm. and with all the shortfall in production, I think we can achieve at the level of 2425. Mm. Okay. Now coming up to the issue of demand. Uh, there's been some concern about India demand and you know exports of Malaysian palm oil at the start of the year. Uh, do you think it's an area of concern? How do we market our palm oil better uh, going into you know to try and encourage higher demand, higher exports for our Malaysian palm oil? As long as long as as long as there's a need for food, there's always a demand for palm oil. You cannot, the world cannot survive without palm oil. You need palm oil. You know, palm oil is in about 2,000 products, mm. right? So it's only the question of you have a short period of low demand. You know, initially early this year, right? When India decided not to buy, uh, of course, it's created a hiccup a bit. But in the long run, I do not worry too much because. This is a zero-sum game. You, know? mm. you only produce so many tons of oil a year, right? And everybody will sell this oil. Mm. 
But one point which I need to highlight, which I did not mention, is our biofuel mandate. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. That's very important. One of the reasons price held hold quite a while last year is because of the biofuel mandate. Not in Malaysia, in Indonesia. Mm. Indonesia went up to the B30. Mm. When the Indonesia went up to B30, the internal consumption increased to 10 million tons a year. Even Malaysia, when we were at B10, or if you move 10% up in terms of your biofuel mandate, mm. you increase domestic consumption by about 500,000 tonnes. That will help a lot in terms of reducing your stockpile. Mm. And I think, I think we need to work on it. The government needs to work in how to create a fund to subsidise this biofuel mandate. Because at current prices, with crude oil at the cheap price, uh, it is expensive to produce biofuel. Mm. But for the sake of the nation, for the sake of everybody, in terms of stabilizing price, I think we need to create some form of uh, fund, a stabilization fund to address this. I think Indonesia has done that, all right? All right? Yeah. And it, it is working well. We, so, uh, is the government looking at this at this point? I, I, I believe the government is looking at it. The previous government was for it. And I think even the present government is also uh, looking at it. It's, the question is, when are we going to implement it? Right. Fully, is it? I see. Do you think we are being uh, not, as ag not aggressive enough in our biodiesel mandate compared to our water? Yeah, I, I would say we, were, we are not aggressive enough as compared to Indonesia. Indonesia moved to B20 to B30. They're already talking about B40. Even the president is talking about B50. So I think we need to follow suit. But don't forget, don't forget there's complexity in each country mm. in implementation. Mm. So implement, implementing it is Malaysia is even more complex in Indonesia when you are a net exporter of oil. All right. Okay. Okay, so budget 2021 is coming up. Uh, what would be your wish list for the Pamoy uh, oh, players? In that? I've got a lot of wish lists uh, for the industry. Uh. Yes. Uh, one is I think the government need to look at the tax structures. I think our tax structure is very archaic. I think we, we, we need to have radical changes in the tax structure. You should be, in tax, you should be paying tax when you make money. Not you pay tax when you are producing it. Mm. A classic example I would give. Uh, example, the Sabah sales tax. Uh, mm. In Sabah, you have to pay a 77.5% sales tax for every for what, all the oils you produce, right? And the threshold is 1,000 ringgit. Meaning when the price kick off at 1,001, you have to pay tax. And your cost of production is 1005 How can you be taxed when you are losing money? Right? Yes. So this, this is an example. Uh. Mm -hmm. So I think we should have radical changes in our tax structures. Okay. Uh. Mm -hmm. It's all right to pay to tax the industry higher than more than 24%. Right. Uh. But lump it out all, all one. Mm. This one, we are already paying tax when we are losing money. You know, when your cost is 1005 and when your cost is 2005, mm. and those people who are producing at 1005, they pay the same amount of tax, no? Right. Not the profit, mm. not, the, not the corporate tax. Yes. But the other taxes all are equal. Yeah. So, any other wish list apart from taxes? Of course, the other one is immediate. We hope the government take a look at this uh, recruitment policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, while we're talking about automation, uh, we're talking about everything else, that is the long term. Mm. But the survival of the industry now today depends on our workforce availability. Mm. So we hope the government review back that decision to freeze foreign workers mm. till December 2020. It's a bit too late by then because, you know, not having foreign worker can be the demise of the industry. Mm. So we hope, we hope the government, and I think we have already conveyed this message mm. to the government. The government is open for discussion. Mm. And in fact, we have had a 
discussion with the minister and he's very responsive towards that and we hope something concrete, something solid come out of it very, very soon. Right. Okay. Great. Um, so now we'll take some questions from the participants. So I think the first question is, do you think that MSPO has been successful in raising the image of Malaysian palm oil? I think the talking about image is separate from upgrading our standards. Mm. I fully subscribe to MSPO because MSPO is mandatory. It addresses a lot of issues which other countries are concerned of, mm. especially in the legality of our workers, mm -hmm. exploitation of workers. If you are MSPO certified, mm -hmm. you know that these are all addressed. Right. Okay. So, so we have to support it, mm. and I'm glad. I'm glad to say that. I mean, yesterday the minister made a statement that until to, until yesterday. We are 85% MSPO certified. Our issues now is only with the independent smallholders. I think the rest, organized smallholders, all the other industry players are all MSPO certified. Mm. Okay, great. Um, okay, the other concern I think the participants have is with regards to perception issues. So they're asking the question of what we can do more to curb the EU perception issues uh, because from their point of view, the recent efforts doesn't seem to be bearing fruits. That's why I said, we, I mean, you cannot satisfy them fully. Mm. Whatever you do will never satisfy them. Mm. But we have to make concerted effort, we engage with them. Right. Uh, so, you know, RSPO has been there a long time, mm -hmm. right? And not everybody can comply to RSPO. Mm -hmm. Maybe the big boys can comply. Right. So even then, we have issues, right? Mm -hmm. So I said the goalposts keep on changing. Uh, today, I, I remember RSPO in 2005, 2006, when they start form, the, the principle and criteria was only 10, 15 pages. Mm -hmm. Today, it's already 200 pages. Right. So a lot of more things. A lot of uh, the goalposts keep on changing, making it difficult for us. Mm. But we still comply. Right. We still comply. Mm. Mm. So good is not good enough. Right. Uh, but if you want to sell to that market, then you have to do it. So it's a willing buyer, willing seller. Mm. If you want to penetrate that market and that market have that standards, you know, just, just look like the three MCPD, mm. they have imposed new limits every time. By all means, if you want to go in to sell them, then you have to make the extra effort to subscribe to that. Yeah. So I guess more engagement. Yes. And, and, and that will be the way. I, I guess it has to be at the government level, perhaps. Yes, yes, yeah. I think, I think we got MPOC, uh, and then we have the joint CPOC with Indonesia. Mm. So these are the organization which is entrusted to basically engage with them. Right, okay. Uh, maybe we have uh, two more minutes, so maybe last two questions. Um, I guess one of the questions is, what are the key issues as to why we are falling behind Indonesia uh, in terms of adopting B30? So I guess that is because we are net exporters, right? That's what you're... I, I would not <laughs> say that is the only reason. Okay. Uh, but I think, I think we, we... I mean, the government have to be resolute in this. Right. Uh, if, if you really want to uh, think that it will have an impact on your cost, impact on your cost, mm. smallholders are very important, mm. then I think we have to implement this. Yeah. Because end of the day, price are dictated by the stock level, your production level. Mm. Taking out 500,000 tons from the stock means a lot in this country. Right. Right? Yes. So I guess the other one is perhaps also economics part of it. Maybe the last question is on the exports. Uh, recently, we've seen very strong exports uh, due to restocking activities. The question is, do you think this can last? So the question is whether the pandemic lasts. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. So if the pandemic is, is over. over, I believe the future is good. Mm, okay, great. So thank you so much, Dato, for you. your insightful sharing. I think we've come to the end of uh, the session on conversation 
on opportunity and challenges uh, for the palm oil sector post COVID-19. So I would just like to thank everyone as well as Dato uh, for the sharing session. Thanks everyone. Thank you.